Once upon a time, motorways in Britain were new and exciting. Speed, speed, that was the excitement, really, of what the motorway brought to driving. And driving in Britain was never going to be the same again. This driver is just about to commit one of the deadly sins of the motorway. Three cars and one lorry in peril, and all because one driver forgot one simple rule. Turn on to this shimmering new road, this great yellow brick road leading to a kind of new Jerusalem. Today, there are 2,211 miles of motorway in Britain. We take them for granted. It's hard to imagine life without them. The joy is of the open road. But just 50 years ago, there were no motorways in this country. Ever tried to pass one of these chaps on a narrow road? And far from idyllic country lanes, Britain's post-war roads were jammed. Our city centres were grinding to a halt. It was wretched and miserable, and the whole, imagine the road stank of petrol, the cars were very leaky at the time, and they belched out a lot of um, oil with their exhaust too. Hot, oily, smelly, petrol-y world, and desperately slow. So things weren't really very romantic in terms of driving in the 1950s. For years, Britain has been handicapped by a road system geared to a bygone age, with traffic jammed at times to a standstill on roads that were never made to take so many family cars. Main roads were desperately slow. They really were, like, clogged arteries. And what the motorways promised, I suppose, was a kind of um, open-heart surgery on the road system. There had been motorways in Europe for 30 years. The first one in the world was built in Italy in 1924, followed by Germany in 1929. The big difference between Germany, Italy and Great Britain in terms of building motorways was, of course, before the war, they had fascism and Nazism. They had totalitarian states there. Think of Mussolini. Mussolini was a man always in a hurry. He liked to be filmed boxing, running, jumping about, doing weights, driving his big Alfa Romeo sports cars. He was always being filmed in a hurry, and he loved that notion of speed. And that was something he was able to impose on Italy. He was always going to run on Rome, march on Rome, speed along, and the motorways came with that philosophy. Hitler, of course, exactly the same, I mean, different sort of character. Hitler said, Viva Hansa Autobahnen, junk! And the Autobahnen, strangely enough, were built. No option. But in Britain, the slow pace of Whitehall bureaucracy held back any plans we may have had to build motorways, and then the war put a stop to them altogether. Peacetime brought more pressing issues for the new Labour government, with new homes and schools to build and a National Health Service to create. This leaflet is coming through your letterbox one day soon. Before motorways could be built, the Special Roads Act had to be passed in 1949. But even then, construction was hampered by rationing. It wasn't until the mid-50s that the first motorway in Britain was built. Rather than the M1, it was the Preston Bypass, later known as the M6. Preston's infamous gridlock had been causing major delays in holding up trade to Scotland, but getting the go-ahead from Whitehall was due to the efforts of one man, Sir James Drake, the county surveyor for Lancashire. He was constantly down here in Whitehall, and he was a sturdy little bloke, and he argued fiercely, uh, and sometimes so fiercely that they wished he would go away, which wasn't very helpful to his own cause. Because he's that sort of chap. A bit acerbic, if you like, but he was an enthusiast. He did bully the ministry, and, uh, and thank goodness he did. That, it's to his credit, because we might not have even got any motorways yet if he hadn't have been so uh, dogmatic and what have you. But he was a bully. Originally planned as eight miles of dual carriageway, work began on the Preston Bypass in 1956. I remember that there was a sort of a lovely feeling about walking out early in the morning on over these fields that were covered with dew and you looked at the grass and you thought, well, this is just fantastic how lucky I am to be having a job like this. Of course, one couldn't get away from the fact that uh, all too soon it was going to be ripped up with big machines and uh, it would never be green grass again in that particular bit. 
Over eight miles long, it will be the first motorway to be built in Britain. The traffic signal gives the all clear, and without delay, a bulldozer goes ahead regardless of anything on its route. It's followed by a series of robot road makers. A fleet of machines were brought in to excavate the ground and level it. Britain's first motorway, the Preston Bypass, was built through some of the wettest weather of the 1950s. It was opened to much press attention on the 5th of December 1958 by the Conservative Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan. Today we are celebrating this country's first motorway. There were lots and lots of people wanting to get onto it the moment it was open. I want to be on it. And I was right at the front of the um, little bit of slip road by the barrier. And the, the official sort of cortege went past with all the VIPs and so on. And the chap who was sitting next to me said, come on, come on, you can get going now, come on. So off we went. So I sort of claimed that I was the first person to drive on the motorway. But I don't know whether that's true or not. Here is Britain's first motorway. In those days, eight miles was quite a long way, and it took a little while, so it was a big thing. I've driven up Preston Bypass. Motor roads which will be confined to high-speed motor traffic with drivers... The traffic was queuing up to come and try the motorway out. Only people wanted to participate in driving the motorway on the first day, I suppose, just uh, so that they could tell the children. I, I went on the motorway on the first day. This is what it feels like at 500 miles an hour. Uh, there was no speed limit at all. Speed, speed, that was the excitement, really, of what the motorway brought to driving. Here's our cameraman's impression of motorway motion. Just a little bit exaggerated, we admit, but it gives you the idea. There was a sort of sense of euphoria. I remember uh, we went with my father to, to drive on the, on, the, uh, on the Preston Bypass, as it was, the very first weekend it was opened, and it was an incredible experience. He didn't know how to do it very well, but he got around because there weren't many cars. I had a, a Ford Zephyr, and uh, I remember doing the complete run, end-to-end, -end, and roundabouts included, at an average speed of 83 miles an hour, and I thought that was pretty spectacular. 83 miles an hour was pretty spectacular in those days. What was so good about early motorway driving was that the motorways were empty. Miles ahead, you couldn't see a, a car on some occasions, or a lorry, or, or, or anything. And so it, there was a feeling of tremendous sort of excitement. Here's a family taking their first run down a motorway. They've heard a lot about these new roads where there are no sharp corners, no hills, and no traffic jams. And they're content to saunter along in the sunshine, enjoying themselves. There was no speed limit and no crash barriers between the carriageways. The government were concerned about how people might behave on the motorway. So they thought, you know, how will people behave? Will they know um, how to drive on a multi-lane road? Will they know how to use junctions? Will they know how to join and leave the motorway? Uh, will they know that they're not allowed to stop? So there was great thought among civil servants about how to educate and govern the conduct of drivers. To help drivers adapt themselves to motorway conditions, the authorities published the Motorway Code later incorporated in the Highway Code, setting out special rules of conduct for safety at motorway speeds. These rules are sound common sense. Good drivers, in fact, have always observed most of them on any fast road. But even so, it's essential to study them carefully before driving on the motorway for the first time. Public information films were produced, explaining the do's and don'ts of motorway driving. and all because one driver forgot one simple rule. Before pulling out to overtake on the motorway, see that the road behind you is clear. They were lucky. You might not be. How far is the next slip road? Well, I believe the sign said eight miles. Eight miles? This driver is just about to commit one of the deadly sins of the motorway. John, what are you going to do? I'm turning back down the other road. You can't. We must go on. What, and add another 16 miles? Not likely. We're late already. Please. Oh, don't worry. There's nothing to it. I'm getting out. You can leave me. 
me here. I think you're mad. We shall be killed. Oh, all right, if you're going to make such a fuss, but I still think it would have been the best thing to do. Watch out, too, for the specially designed road signs. A mile ahead of your turn-off point, you'll see a warning sign. The motorway offered a design opportunity. Road signs in Britain were chaotic and came in different sizes, symbols, colours and shapes. The result was frustration and confusion. When the motorways were still in the planning phase, the government had appointed a committee to investigate the issue of new signage. They thought, oh, perhaps we might need the help of a designer. So that was quite a very new thing for somebody actually, for a committee, a government committee, to employ um, a consultant designer. How do they differ from the present motor signs? Uh, we've used a mixture of block letters and small letters uh, for greater legibility. Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert were charged with developing a new signage system for Britain's motorways. They realised that the absolute essence of an efficient motorway signage system was clarity. The signs had to be easy to read, instantly recognisable to motorists. Motorists had to understand what they were saying and it had to convey essential information to them. But motorists really didn't need to waste time thinking. The basic unit, obviously, is the typeface. And from that, you build out. So in order to achieve this simplicity, they had to do some very complicated work behind the scenes. So they thought through every single aspect of the way in which those signs would be read. The lettering always stayed the same and you read the symbol first and then you picked out the lettering and then you got the sense of what the message was and the route numbers. So basically it's very simple and the colours. And we've also put white letters on a blue background for the same reason. I remember the formula that I used was ultramarine plus azure blue plus um, zinc white designers colours. We were amazed at the size of them. It staggered us. We, we just couldn't comprehend that you need a road sign as big as we were making them. But of course, you're travelling at 70 mile an hour and you want to pick up the directions early. So they're logical and they're correct, but we were surprised. They are beautifully elegant. They're like works of art in their own right, but they're also completely utterly functional and that is why today over 40 years later that signage hasn't changed it doesn't need to change perfect typography is perfect typography when you're driving along a motorway or a British road thanks to Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert you never have to think about the signs you're looking at keep it simple and it's easier to read and remember and it looks good in its own right in the landscape the Kinnear Calvert partnership went on to redesign all of the road signs in Britain. The next motorway to be completed was the M1. At just 74 miles, it was the first long-distance motorway in Britain. It stretched from St Albans in Hertfordshire to Dunchurch in Warwickshire. The M1 was opened on the 2nd of November 1959 by Ernest Marples, the Transport Minister for Macmillan's Tory government. It is in keeping with the bold, exciting and scientific age in which we live. It's interesting, the first real motorway in Britain, the M1, which opened in November 1959, was basically a straight line. I mean, it's like a long concrete strip, just cutting its way through the landscape, paying virtually no reference to topography. I mean, who cares about hills, rivers, vales, valleys? Just build as straight as you can. That was how motorways were conceived. Straight line, very fast, no messing around. And I suppose, as a reflection of that, the actual design, the engineering, and the minimalist architecture around it in terms of structures, bridges principally, were just brutally functional. Highly efficient organization on a vast scale both played a vital part. The building of the 55-mile northbound section was split into four contracts. The 16 million pound contract John Lang and Sons Limited secured them all, but had just 19 months to complete them. The consulting engineers were Sir Owen Williams and partners. Sir Owen had been knighted for his design of the original Wembley Stadium and was a well-known public figure. Sir Owen, this is something almost revolutionary in this country in the way of road construction, isn't it? I think I can say that there is no other greater effort being made in, in the world comparable to this. Well, Sir Owen was a, 
a very forceful character. He was a great man to work with because he was in a wonderful fund of anecdotes because of all the people he'd met during his career. But he'd established this reputation as a very prominent engineer architect. 48 surveyors and engineers were engaged in calculating and setting out the centre line of the motorway. I forget now how many people there were, landowners and people who were involved in that, but there must have been about 300 odd. And he went to see them all, personally, so that, you know, the, the objections to the road were minimal because he'd been to see people and, of course, at the time, building a motorway and, and trying to come to terms with the sort of new motorway aid was something that people were all in favour of. I thought it was great. To prepare an accurate construction programme... In all, only five houses and three bungalows were demolished to make way for the M1. Twenty million tonnes of rock, chalk and earth had to be excavated to clear the land. The site was so vast that the latest technology was used to survey it. Keeping track of what's happening can best be done from the air. By helicopter, checks can be made all along the route in a matter of hours. Five thousand men were employed to work on the project, and mobile canteens were built every two and a half miles to cater for them. In all, 183 bridges were built on the M1. On average, one was completed every three days. The scene, I mean, you've got to imagine the scene. It's hard to believe that great construction program. I mean, it's heroic in scale, Roman in scale, Victorian in scale. The M1 was built at a rate of one mile every eight days. I mean, today, when we find it very difficult to build an Olympics or to build a Wembley Stadium, try and imagine what that means. Just really think, a mile every eight days, completed. It's really, really fast. It's the speed the Chinese work today in rebuilding Shanghai or Beijing. That's what the Brits could do at the time. Cuttings, embankments, bridges, two-level junctions, all were taking shape in the scarred earth. I could name and remember very clearly, particular, I suppose, the, the muckshifting foreman or, or the, the actual agent, the sub-agent on muckshifting, because these were characters of their own. They had hired and bought in enormous fleets of often great big motor scrapers, things capable of carrying 40 metres of muck at one particular time from one place to another. These guys had a life and a way, you know, and a rule that nobody got in their way because these <laughs> machines were enormous. One machine doing the work of up to a thousand men, and each one costing about as much as a pick and shovel man might earn in a long working lifetime. So the earth-moving navvy of today is first and foremost a machine man, a driver. A driver as skilled in his way as the driver of a track racing car. And had his big yoke, it's like cleaning the rest of the ground to get it level, you know, and so, so, so just like a sand dune, these big machines flying up and down. How long did it take you to get to know how this machine reacts to all these controls? Well, I'm quite a while now working at machinery for Wimpies. I'm seven years driving this type of machine. Men of all colours and creeds from all over the Commonwealth are helping to build this great new motorway. The construction of the M1 was really, I suppose, a 1950s version of the building of the railways 120 years before. The men that built them were essentially navvies. I've navvied here in Scotland, I've navvied in the south. The term navvy is derived from the inland navigators who built the canal system in Britain in the 18th century. Mostly Irishmen, Navi became the term used to describe all manual labourers. Between 1951 and 1961, over half a million Irishmen came to Britain to work in the building and construction industry. A bold Navi man, me boys, a bold Navi man. I've done me graft and stuck it like a bold Navi man. The majority of those would have left school before the age of 15 because there was no free secondary education. They were coming from a predominantly rural background, disadvantaged, unskilled, uneducated, um, but well used to hard graft, out of doors, very tough, very determined people. And they were a godsend to the construction industry in Britain. But the only thing I knew then was labouring. 
then I got driving a machine and driving cranes and bulldozers and all sorts of machinery, tower cranes and all that, and that set me off for good or better, travelling up and down the country. I was always going out to a job to go with somebody who was working there. That was your, your reference, you know, and uh, that's how you got on. You hadn't any details or anything, just come in tomorrow, like, you know. They were used to hardship. They were used to working out of doors. It was sink or swim. They were determined that they would succeed. There was no going back. So they had that dogged determination, that stamina, that staying power. Um, Paddy was used to being down the trench, was quite happy to get in there and make good money at it because he had the hours he could put in the overtime. And where there's muck, there's brass. The work goes on day and night in all weathers, rain or shine. Here at Newport Pagnall, the halfway house, the work is nearing completion. Enormous concrete mixers are at it 24 hours a day. That was hard, very hard work. Really hard work. They'd be there digging, pick and shovel, and uh, they earned the money. Every penny that was earned there was earned in the hard way, for labour, in my opinion. As each section of motorway was completed, the site moved on and the workforce needed to move with it. Many of the workers stayed in local farms or bed and breakfasts. There are landladies who have a taste for looking after the kind of men who do real men's work, men with hair on their chests and dried concrete on their boots, and who do by a... I remember going into one digs, and uh, I thought, beautiful, beautiful. They said, I went upstairs to bed and the sheets were black. And I says, am I in the right room here? She says, yeah. I says, I'm sorry, look. And she says, anything is good enough for motorway workers. For the motorway men who wanted to keep their families with them, mobile caravan sites were set up along the route. It's estimated that as much as half the workforce on the M1 were Irish. There were so many that two Catholic chaplains were sent from Ireland to administer to them on site. Now the Catholics would gather round. He wouldn't, if, if it was a nice day, he'd be in the open air, just have a table in front of him and he'd say mass like, you know, and give out communion and everything. They were great that way. The notes would go up on the, on the canteen. Or you, you'd get to know it by word of mouth. Might be half past 10, 11 o'clock, but it didn't make any difference. As long as he was finished for opening time at the pub. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got your wages, like, you queued up, there was a, a wages office, like, yeah, a pigeonhole that paid you out, and like, uh, there was no problem that way, you see. That was all done on the site, that was OK. We want the dinner hours, eh? We want right through. You only live for payday. The other days were dead days, you know, and uh, they didn't give us wages as such, they gave us beer tokens. You know, well, that's how we done with them, like, you know. <laughs> Everything was how much beer you can get with it. If, if I buy this this week, how much will I live for a drink? And Wages were good, but working so far from home in an itinerant culture was to cost many of the navvies dearly. We were just displaced people. Just displaced people, you know. I used to look at all the people in me and I thought, is this going to be the end product? They wash down mud with pints and quarts of beer. And now we're on the road again with McAlpine's Fusiliers. The final touches were being added to the first long distance motorway in the country. The M1 was finished on time and on budget at a cost of 16 and a half million pounds. The M1 was opened in almost an apocalyptic atmosphere, that there was a feeling that this road was going to solve 
Britain's transport problems. I mean, it, that, that's rather oversimplified, but, but people did feel that, and there was a, an enormous amount of excitement about it. 110 miles of carriageway, 200 bridges and culverts, all in 19 months. Impossible, they said. This was the beginning of a new era. They'll never do it. But they did, because we're driving along it now at 70 miles an hour. It was seen as a, a glimpse into the future, the future when we would have a network of these and most people would be able to make most of the length of their journeys on these very high-quality roads. No crossroads. Two level junctions with and it was a time of great optimism. The, the, the general view was extremely positive. It was all very exciting. A tremendous undertaking, triumphantly fulfilled. We were invited to the opening of the M1, and I can remember that vividly. It was a beautiful sunny summer day, and we were told where we would be meeting for someone to cut the ribbon or whatever and make the speech. And I remember driving along and it was all this brown soil. And these signs were for real. These were the real beautiful, I thought, white on blue signs with our lettering and everything. And against, in the sun and against the earthiness of the banks, it was just very surreal. And nobody else on the motorway. So we went on and on and on and on. And in the end, we came to the end. There was no more motorway. And we somehow missed the junction or the t wherever um, the ceremony was going to happen. So we didn't, we didn't go to it in the end. We missed it. All our directors were invited to go to the opening. And we had passes to go down the motorway, all the way down, 50 miles down the motorway, to get to the opening. And the, our directors went in the Rolls Royce, the company Rolls Royce and it blew up like a tea kettle. It, it, Travelling at 50, 60 mile an hour, even Rolls Royces in that day and age weren't designed for motorway speeds. Britain's first motorway is proving a big attraction for drivers at the weekend. It's the novelty of a high-speed run, I suppose. And just as people once went to Croydon to see aeroplanes fly, so now M1 attracts the curious. They watch from bridges, and they travel in coaches on sightseeing jaunts. Sundays were often the busiest days on the motorway. The, the Sunday afternoon family drive was very popular at this time, and family, many families would go out and uh, drive um, along the motorway just to, to kind of experience it. The motorway became a destination in itself, a tourist site, because it was so unique and so special. A small ceremony, but a big event. And traffic was soon taking this opportunity of trying out a new experience in British road travel. A new experience, yes, but of course not every car is in condition for sustained high speed. Try and imagine what it would be like. You're at the wheel of your family, Morris Oxford, which is a top speed of about 50 miles an hour, realistically. You're wobbling along down some A road, you come to a roundabout, press heavily on the brakes, down, and the old gearbox, crunch, crunch, and then turn on to this shimmering new road, this great yellow brick road leading to a kind of new Jerusalem. The M1, for example, stretching for 75 miles north from London and on goes your car, it sounds totally different. Off the tarmac, onto concrete, the, the wheels, instead of going start to go sound. It's an incredibly noisy experience. The car's wandering around this old car with the wind blowing across the side of the motorway. I remember the first motorway totally exposed. On these new wide roads, one gets no sensation of speed. And even at 75 miles an hour, you might well be cruising. Then, of course, the temperature gauge would go up in the car. The oil pressure, of course, would drop. <laughs> and a 60 mile an hour sprint would turn into a 10 mile an hour crawl and the thing would break down. Some drivers don't seem to grasp the fact that a car must be in first class trim if it's going to be driven non-stop for miles at top speed or thereabouts. Engines and tyres must be in condition to take such a test. So the average car was clunky, solid, old. Cars looked almost mock Tudor in their design and they were like mock Tudor houses on wheels, I suppose. They weren't designed for motorways. And I must say, I drove up it very carefully because I, I had heard tales that uh, engines would overheat if you flogged it too hard. So I remember driving, once we drove all the length of the M1 at 45 miles an hour, which is sort of unbelievable now. <laughs> With no legal speed limit, the new 74-mile motorway would push many cars to the limit. The RAC 